I remember you saying that you heard Roosevelt on the radio. The one I really heard him was when Japan bombed over there. Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor. You were born in 30, 1940. You were 10 years old. You were 15 when the war ended. What was your sense of, of, of politics in the day? You knew that Roosevelt was president, but did you have a sense of politics in the Beaver Falls? Did, were you aware of any of that growing up? No. I never paid any attention to it. And we had no reason. My dad was Democrat. That's right. I was Democrat. You know, once I got out of the Navy and the mills, that's when I started learning the difference between Democrats and Republicans. What about your family heritage? Now, you're Hungarian. Or your parents are both immigrants. Grandparents are immigrants. So you were first generation Hungarian. Was there pride in that? Or were you like a lot of people? You wanted to move that behind? You wanted to be Americans, not Hungarians? What was it like growing up with this Hungarian heritage? I knew I was Hungarian. I couldn't speak much Hungarian when I was a little kid, you know. People would say, well, they call me hunky, you know, Hungarian hunkies. And, but, uh, was that a derogatory thing when they called you hunky? Was that an insult? Sometimes it was, depending on who was saying it. Some people would say it, and I'd just laugh. Other than say it, I'd tell them, you want your mouth busted in, call me it again. So you grew up in a time that is very different than your children's time, and it's certainly different than your grandchildren's time. And what I mean by that is there were so many immigrants in these communities, right? So you grew up with people who, who spoke Hungarian and Italian and spoke Polish. What was it like to live with all these immigrants and all these sort of foreign influences and the food and all that stuff? It was a real melting pot when you were growing up in Beaver Falls. Did you have a sense of that? You know, I was a Hungarian. My friends were Italian. You know, you didn't give it a second thought. It's just the way it was. Did you appreciate that? Sure I did. Well, today, I mean, we take a bit of pride in our heritage. You know, there's Italian-American celebrations, right? There's the fiesta down in Aliquippa every year. You know, there's this uh, SMPJ not far from here. You know, they celebrate their stuff. I imagine no one did that in your day. No one celebrated the heritage. It's just what you were. You were Hungarian. Yes, you were Slovakian. Did. Yes, they did. They did. They had the Hungarian club, the Polish club, the Italian clubs. They all celebrated like there, you know. Okay. It was a big thing. Of all the different kinds of foods and the celebrations, what was your favorite in terms of the, uh, you know, the different nationalities and the different heritages around you? Like? Oh, I used to go to DCNs, eat Italian food. I'd go to Gazelbach on a farm. It was all Hungarian food. And you even had a chance to experience Chinese, which is, I think, a rather rare thing growing up in Beaver Falls with the Y family. Oh, yeah, with the Y family, yeah. What was well, that like? Oh, we had a big meal. I'd go there and they'd have Chinese food. It was comic because we'd have tea. One time, the old uncle came from New York, and uh, this one American kid was there. He had a cup of tea, and he was putting milk in it, sugar in it. I'd do the same thing. But I heard this old Chinese guy, yuck, 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 to Mrs. Y. And I said to Frank, what's the matter? What's he on about? Frank said, look at him. He's ruining that good tea. You don't ruin good tea with that junk. <laughs> it, it didn't taste as good, but that's the way I drank it. Then in 1960, when the Pirates won the series, Ray took Frank and I, I forget who else went, we were going to the game, and uh, he took us to this big, fancy Chinese restaurant. I mean, we ate like kings. He said, eat what you want. Order what you want. I, look, I couldn't read Chinese. You mentioned that you used to work in a donut shop when you oh, were a yeah. kid. We talked one time about how many donut shops were in Beaver Falls. Can you name them? There was uh, Orms. There was, uh, well, we made them there at that place I worked. The Angeles, yeah, they were there. There was uh, one down on Fifth Avenue or something like that. Oh, Shomers. And there was another one. Tom Six was, I think, on the Fourth Avenue. Were they good bakeries? Yeah. So, how were your donuts? They were great. <laughs> Every Saturday, the old baker would make dough for the donuts. He'd mix the dough and roll them out. And I'd cut the donuts and save the balls and I'd put them on the trays, these big wire trays, and put them down in that hot oil, boiling oil. But the old guy is a Greek fellow, Mustrik. 
Musk Creek Bakery. It was above a bowling alley there on 7th Avenue. His wife was Hungarian. Sometimes he'd over bake angel food cakes. I'd go home with a shopping bag full of angel food cakes. I'd ride home in a bus like that because I'd go right after school. I'd stay over at 7, 8 o'clock at night. But on the weekends, I'd start like 8 in the morning till 4 in the afternoon. I'd have to clean. I'd have to take a scraper and scrape all the dough was tramped on, in on the floor, scrape that all up. And then after everybody was gone, I had to scrub the floor and put newspapers down. And I'd scrub the cooler and put the goodies in there. And at one time, I thought, man, I'm going to eat one of them cupcakes. Right? So I, I started eating and he, the door opened. And I hurry up and threw the cupcakes in the newspaper, wrapped it up. He saw me. So we waited till I got out of the cooler. He said, hey, Paul, come here, come here. He said, what did you do that for? I said, uh, I him hard around. I don't know what to say. He said, look, Paul, why did I tell you something? You want a cupcake? You get it, you eat it, don't sneak it. Which he was right. I accepted my tongue lashing for it and everything. You know. So then from then on, I thought, the hell with it. If I got hungry, I'd eat a cupcake or a roll or something, and I didn't care if he was standing there. But uh, the girls worked in the bakery. They cleaned the showcases. Boy, there was one looker, man. She was older than me. Dorothy Cass Butis was her name. Oh, man. <laughs> I was really Google-eyed when I'd be around her. Uh, we got along, you know. I didn't ask for a date or anything, you know. I, How old were you when you worked there? 16. How old were you when you bottled 7-Up with your brother Louie? Oh, I didn't bottle. I just went there and big with him. And uh, he would mix everything up, put them big bags of sugar in them machines and everything, put the ingredients in. Well, I just sat around and helped, you know. I watched him. Then I'd, I'd go to sleep. He'd have to stay awake and watch all that stuff, you know. Turn the machines off, and in the morning we'd go, I'd go home with him. So how old would you be? Oh, around 13, 14. That's when that guy hired me on a 7-Up truck. We went as far as Aliquippa, Beaver, Beaver Falls, all over delivering 7-Up. And this one time, this one I got wind of what, what he was doing. He'd say, Paul, leave me a pocket. When you move these cases, leave me a pocket there. And I didn't understand why. I found out later, we'd go in the back room. He'd say, is that a case of beer? Take two of them out, put them in the truck. <laughs> and then cover it up with seven up. <laughs> so I thought, what the hell with you, buddy? I'm going to give my dad a case of beer. <laughs> I did. I steal a case of beer from my dad. <laughs> oh, gosh. Jeff, did you ever hear of the, the great strawberry strike? <laughs> I started Union. <laughs> <laughs> so you, that was when you were like 10 years old, wasn't it? Yeah. You were really young. You want to tell us that story? Oh, Mr. Arnold. I was getting three cents a quart of strawberries. And, uh, hell, I'd pick five, maybe 10 quarts to their one. So I thought, at the end of the day, man, I'd have a gang of quarts of strawberry picked. So after a while, I thought, hey, the hell would I, I want five cents a quart instead of three cents. And I forget who I talked to, somebody I was friends with there. And I said, you know, I'm going to tell Mr. Arnold I want five cents a quart. So we'd have our lunch break. Oh, Mr. Arnold says, time to go back to work. I'd sit there. He'd say, Paul, did you hear what I said? Time to go back. I said, no, Mr. Arnold, I want five cents a quart. I said, and you know I cannot pick anybody you got working for you. You know, I said, I want compensated for that. You know, I should be credited with something. He said, oh, well, I'm sorry, I can't give you a nickel. I said, well, I'm sorry, I can't pick strawberries for you anymore either. <laughs> he said, no, come on, Paul. I said, no, you come on. After a while, I sat there about an hour, and he said, okay, Paul, I'll give you five cents a quart. 